this is really for anyone that's involved in musicianship or is involved in actually facilitating worship with a band. And I'm going to try and hit some good practices that will help us to grow in our leadership. But I also want to try and debunk the mystery of this thing over here today to perhaps help some of the worship leaders that hear the drums and know how important the drums are in worship, but maybe get a better understanding of how you can actually use this beast. So David's going to be doing some demonstrating for me today to try and help us. But just as we go into things, I want us to think about the way we prepare our week, because leading a band doesn't start on Sunday morning. And I think a very bad practice we can get into is to turn up to our Sunday morning services, have a quick run through our songs, and that's us ready for worship. Because to me, that does not feel like a well-prepared sacrificial offering of praise for the Lord. For me, worship preparation starts on Sunday, for the next Sunday. It's a week-long process of being in the river with the Lord, trying to decipher what it is that the Lord wants to do through us. And I don't just mean for our worship leaders, because I think that very often we put a huge burden of responsibility on the worship leader to facilitate everything. They print off music, they, they maybe you know, organize all the songs, all of the things that need to be done practically for the band. But actually you as musicians are equally important to the worship leader and we need everyone to be on page. So I'm going to hit some stuff firstly for worship leaders and choosing our songs, because that really is one of the key things. Say it's late on Saturday night, and you think, oh man, I've got church again in the morning. You get your computer out, you get your song lists out, and you think, what songs am I going to do? And you start going through them. This is the latest Bethel song. This is the latest Hillsong song. People seem to love this, but I just have no idea what I'm supposed to choose for Sunday. So you know what to do. You're going to pray. You're going to say, Lord, just give me a set of songs right now. But the reality is you've left it too late. You should have been doing this much earlier in the week. And when we get to that point where we think, well, I'm going to choose this song because we haven't sung it for ages. I don't think the Lord is particularly interested in what we have sung recently and what we haven't sung recently. He wants a worship offering that is going to support the whole service. It's going to support what's being preached. It's going to support what's being prophesied in the church that morning. So we need to be hearing the Lord for these things. We we don't choose our favorite songs every week. There are some worship leaders that will come to worship and I just go, I know I know the songs. I can tell you. Like don't show me a song list. I think he is going to start with this song. The second song will be yep, I'm right again. I'm not often right, but I'm always right about this person's song list. We need to be following the spirit when we are choosing our songs. It might sound great when Maverick City do it, but it might sound terrible when you do it with an acoustic guitar in your congregation on a Sunday morning. So we've got to check what we are choosing and really try to be organized in our week, really try to find the spirit from the beginning of the week. And something that Jonathan said today, I thought was so good, and he says this over and over, is set people up for a win. And I think one thing that is a disaster is when worship leaders are choosing songs really late in the week and the musicians don't have time to get themselves prepared. Because the reality is we can learn to sing a song much more quickly than a guitarist can learn to play a riff. The guitarist is going to have to practice. The guitarist has got to get that thing into him. He's got to learn the song. And so set people up for a win. I think it's so important to realize that it doesn't matter how prepped the worship leader is, the band will only be as effective as the least prepared member. So if there's somebody in our band that doesn't know where the song's going, doesn't know how the chord sequences are working, hasn't practiced, hasn't worked out how this whole thing comes together, then the chances of leading worship really successfully on a Sunday morning are going to be greatly reduced. So we've got to give each other a chance by choosing our songs as early as we possibly can. And I think leading with a band is so categorically different than leading on your own with a guitar. 
I love leading on my own because I don't need to think about anyone else. My chords are going to be the chords that I choose. The speed is going to be the, the speed that I choose. I don't care if I'm speeding up and slowing down. The drummer is not going to affect that. I will do what I want. I'm happy. Thank you very much. But when we've got a band, you've got to be so much more considerate of what's happening with everyone else. You've got to be listening to each other. We can't just set the tempo ourselves. We've got to use other gifts in the band in order to bring our worship sets to life properly. And there are just so many moving parts. And I think very often, if you haven't played in bands before, you maybe don't have a full appreciation of everything that's available at your fingertips to make sound and to be effective in worship. So these are the kind of things I want to really have a look at today. And remember this as well. It doesn't matter how competent you are. You're going to have a whole range of different competencies in the band. There are going to be very good musicians who are really good at what they do. And there are going to be musicians who are not so good and maybe are new to the band. This morning we talked about having a new drummer in Peel who really struggled in the first few weeks because very often what musicians do is they learn in their bedrooms. They don't play to metronomes. Now I have grown up in studios where everything is done to a metronome, so I have this built-in clock. So if I hear a time signature, I'm going to lock into that all the time. A lot of musicians just learn to play with no metronome, and that's cheating because it means that there are parts of a song that you can't play, but you thought you could because you could slow them down and then speed them up again. So we need to be training one another to be excellent in, our very, in, in the instruments that we play. And preparation is absolutely key. So the earlier we can get our songs onto Planning Centre, the better. Saturday night is not preparing our teams for a win. Who plays in bands that sometimes put their songs up on a Saturday night? Anyone here? One. <laughs> Two. It's the West and the South. Oh, good, and Douglas as well. Thank you. So it's all of us. So we're all in the absolutely in the same boat. But actually, I do think one of the key things when we're leading bands is communication in the week is absolutely essential. It's so important that we can take the band on a journey with us. We don't want them just turning up to do a set of songs. We want them to be ready and spiritually prepared as well as musically prepared. And one of the things that we do in the West, which works really well for us, is we generally try to pull four people together every single week. So we'll get a WhatsApp group for worship on a Sunday morning, and it will have the preacher the service leader has a prophetic person in it, and it will have the worship leader as well. So we get the four guys together, probably on a Tuesday, Wednesday, and just start to ask, what are you guys feeling? What are you sensing for the weekend? It's great to have prophetic guys, because they sometimes get those slightly off-the-wall senses of where the service is going to go. And even as a preacher, sometimes I go, I'm not feeling that at all. But then you get to Sunday morning and the service just starts to move towards where the prophetic person said it was going to go. And then you're going, hang on, we've got a set of songs that really work for where God wants to go because we've been talking about it and preparing for this in the week. Speak to the preachers. What are you speaking on? How are we going to effectively support worship this week? It's, it's no good having a preach on the Father heart of God and then coming up and doing a bunch of Holy Spirit songs. We need to get something that flows and something that has a focus in it. And the more we talk, the more effective we can be when we pull our bands together. And remember, your musicians need time particularly if you're introducing new songs. New songs are not always easy to learn. A lot of guys are just kind of playing off a chord chart. It's, they're not reading music. They're, they have to actually get the song into their head, the melody into their head, the feel of the song into their head so that they can play as effectively as they possibly can. So the more lead time that you can give to your musicians, the more effectively they'll be able to support you. But of course, it's not just about music. And actually, worship is much more spiritual than it is musical. And being spiritually prepared is a really essential part of everything that we do. I love reading about David's worship band. I don't know if you knew he had a worship band, but he did. It's talked about in 1 Chronicles 25, 6 to 7. And the word says this. These men were under the direction of their fathers as they made music at the house of the Lord. Their responsibilities included 
the playing of cymbals, harps, lyres, electric guitars, I knew it, at the house of the Lord. Asaph and Judithan and Heman reported directly to the king. They had their families and they were all trained in making music before the Lord. And each of them, 288 in total, was an accomplished musician. It's quite interesting, isn't it? That David's band was a well-trained band. It was a skillful band, but it didn't just become that overnight. They were clearly people who were dedicated to improving their level of skill. And something I loved today was Dave came to speak to me after one of the sessions and just said, how, how do I develop as a guitarist? And I gave him the best advice I would give any of you. I said, don't go to a Christian musician, go to a secular one. Go and learn how to play music that has more than four chords in it. Learn proper music and then bring it back to the church and we'll spiritualize it and it'll be absolutely awesome. But I would really encourage you just to get um, communication with your groups, get your WhatsApp going. If you have a new song coming in, Get it on that group so that people can hear it and get the particular version of the song. There's no point giving a band a guy playing the song on an acoustic guitar. They need to hear the whole thing playing together. So make sure you choose the right version as well that you want people to try and follow. But don't just turn up on Sunday mornings. If you're a musician in a band and you're not leading worship, you're still leading worship. You should be praying. If you've got a worship leader who's leading that weekend, I, honestly, I'll ask you a question. You don't have to raise your hands to this, but it will convict you. I wonder how many of you have ever prayed for your worship leader during the week? On how many of you have ever prayed, Lord, give them a prophetic sense of where it's going. Lord, make them skillful. Lord, deal with any nerves that they may have, Lord, put a prophetic flow into them. Lord, give them spontaneous. Have you ever prayed for your worship leaders? They're carrying a key ministry in the church that can literally change the whole atmosphere of our services. It can change the effectiveness of a preach. If we have incredible spirit-filled worship, the word can land in a much deeper and more transformational way. So pray for members of your team. Practice so that when you come to worship, you're not having to stare at your music all the time. Now, we're not a performance church, and the one thing I never want people to feel pressure about is, oh, gotta, we're taking the music stands away, and we've got to learn every song. I think there are benefits to doing that. It's quite nice to know a song so well that you don't have to think about it. Because I think one of the most distracting things for worship bands is when they, know, they don't know the songs at all, and they have to think more about the music than they do about Jesus. And what's beautiful is when we have bands that know the song so well that they can engage with the congregation in worshiping Jesus. They can just get into that place with them where it's not about, oh, is this the, is this the bridge that's coming up? Is this the minor chord? Or where are we going with the song? Know the songs so that they don't distract you away from the focus of your worship, but get people on that journey in the week. It will really take your worship to the next level. So we're gonna go into a bit of practicality stuff now, which I hope is helpful. I'm gonna start by thinking about the way that we communicate on stage. Because I, I think that one of the things I find really interesting, if you watch a lot of bands, is sometimes you can have a worship leader who stands at one end of the band. I don't understand that because I think if you have got to communicate with the keyboard player, with the guitarist and with the drummer, actually you need to be in the middle of this whole thing so that you, you got, everyone can see you for starters. People do need to be able to see the leader so that if you're giving any form of signal, the band has a rough idea of where things are going to go. And I want to talk particularly for people who are not using instruments, because I, I've always led worship with an instrument, which honestly makes it so easy. Because musically, I can transition all my songs, I can give clear cues, I can you know, quieten my guitar for where we're coming into a crescendo. There are things I can do because I'm a musician that I think it's harder to do if you're a singer. 
But I also think some of the best worship leaders are singers with no musical instrument because there are advantages to doing that as well. But there are certain things that a singer can't do. A singer is unlikely to be able to set the tempo of the song. Singers are not necessarily going to find it easy to control the dynamics, the energy of a song. The singer is going to find it quite difficult at times to say to the band, this is the sequence of chords that we're going to use. And I want to just think about some of these things to help us to grow in these areas. And then it's also difficult to transition songs from one part to another. So what do you do if you're singing in the band, but you're not leading by an instrument. And I think we have quite a number of people in that category who are singing and leading, but not necessarily playing an instrument. Now, the one thing I think that is a huge advantage of that is physical worship. Like for me, I said today, I watched Lindy leading today. I don't know if you guys saw her, but she took me to a next level of worship today. I just, and she wasn't really doing anything other than just worshiping. But the way she worshipped really impacted me. And I thought, wow, this girl loves Jesus. And she, I'm going to love him too because she's love. I'm going to be like Lindy. I'm going to love him too. And there is something beautiful about being able to kneel and to raise our hands and to clap, which is very difficult when you've got a guitar. So, I mean, any guitarist will tell you, I once made the mistake when I was leading worship of getting down on my knees. I thought, well, I feel like I should get on my knees. But when I stood up, I'm standing on the cable. It ripped the jack out of my guitar. I've got, it's very difficult to get up and I'm playing and I'm going, where is the, where's the cable gone? It's on the floor now. It's, re- it's difficult to do some of these things with an instrument. Singers, I, can, I think, can lead congregations not just vocally, but they can actually exhort the congregation into a deeper engagement with God in a way that a musician will find it quite difficult to do. I think drummers are in the very unique position where drummers, are it's such a physical thing to do. There's so much movement. And one of the things that really ministers to me is when I see a worshiping drummer. Like that is like top notch musician leading worship, making an absolute noise at the back of the band. Come on. That's just, I love that. That is fantastic. But I think there are some challenges for singers that we need to think about. How do we, how do we communicate to the band that we want to go back to a previous section of the song? How do I jump from my final chorus back into a repeated bridge? How do I bring the music down so it's the piano only rather than having the full band play? How do I get the band to build up so it doesn't fizzle out? This is where communication for the whole band, I think, is so important. Now, you may be kind of thinking, why are you talking to us about this stuff? Well, my whole life before church was spent in bands. I used to tour with a big band in the UK and we went all over Britain with our band just playing in different venues and different things. And one of the things that we had to do is we had to learn good communication because we were a 10-piece band. So we did like funk music. People would dance, it was brilliant, loved it. Big horn section. But there were so many moving parts, four keyboards. We had two electric guitars. It was just monstrous and great fun. But I was singing in the band. I didn't play in the band. I wrote the songs, but I sang and I had to learn How do we, if we want to go into a different part of the song, how do we start to move around these things? How do we change time signature? Because our songs were quite technical. How do we know when we're changing key? All of these things. And so we developed a really simple system. Uh, And it's as easy as this. And it works perfectly in worship music. You have three components to every song that you play. Sometimes only two. Sometimes only one. And the components are this. You have a verse. You have a chorus. And you have a bridge or a tag, whatever you want to call it. That is three parts. For me, in my band, a verse was always number one. A chorus was always number two. And a bridge was always number three. Now, because our songs were set in the way they had to follow a certain order, they were like, you know, you couldn't kind of flip between one bit and another. But when we wanted to be spontaneous at the end of a song, for me, leading this big band where there are so many people to communicate with. If I felt like I want to go back to the bridge, I didn't want to have to go around the whole band and go to the horn section and say, we're going to the bridge, chaps, and then to guitar bridge, and then the drummer who never hears you anyway, going to the bridge, and he's just, he doesn't care where you go, yeah, whatever, I'm in my own world. And so I would just hold up my fingers, 
three fingers. We are in the band would immediately know, right, we're going back into the bridge. Or if we're going back to a verse, we would just hold up a number one, and that's it. We go back to the verse. And these are really simple signals that you can use with your band, particularly with bigger bands like Douglas, where it's quite difficult. And, and for me personally, I, don't, I find it a bit off-putting when I hear worship leaders going, bridge, bridge, go to the bridge. And I think Jesus is getting hacked off. He's out of there. He's long gone. And we're, now we're worshiping on our own. It's a nightmare. And so having a simple numbering system can work really well. And if you're using tag chart charts, just put the number between what you're doing. If it's a verse, the only thing musicians really need to know is what is the chord sequence we're playing. And then they can adjust quite quickly to your voice if you're singing quietly. They can come down. If you're starting to go for it, they should be able to follow those vocal cues. But think about using a simple numbering system that allows you to navigate through your songs in a way that causes as little disruption as possible. What if you want to come down to just the piano only? You can very easily just give a little signal to a pianist. And if the band is watching, then hopefully they'll know you're you're going to a piano and you can just put your hand down if you want to come down. If you want a crescendo, you can rate, just talk to your band and learn how to communicate in the, in the band in a way that gives you full control so that the music can support the way that you're singing. Now, one of the most important things, and I would say this is where generally worship crashes, is in transitions. And by transitions, I don't mean transitions from verse to chorus or chorus to bridge. I mean between songs. This is where, this is where it happens. Like I, for me, the most important part of worship is the transition. I know the song. We're going to sing through the song. We, we know the words. It's ministering to us. But the transition is where I often find myself going, oh, please, somebody do something. Somebody do something. Somebody just sing. Please just do something. Those moments can feel, and you're probably aware of it, where it feels like worship is dying. And it's getting awkward, and nobody's quite sure what to do, and it goes on longer and longer and longer. And you can almost sense that there's a, a lift in the congregation where there's a loss of confidence. And I think that maybe what you'll uh, be very familiar with in your own experience is when you play with bands, what bands tend to do is they will practice songs over and over and over again. And the band knows the song really, really well, but what they didn't practice was how you transition from one song to the next. And very often what I would do with a band is I would say, guys, we'll go from the last chorus, so we're just going to do a tiny little bit of this last song, then we're going to go through our transition into the first verse or the chorus or whatever we're starting in the next song. And I would actually get the band to play through the transitions much more than I would get them to rehearse the song. They probably have arrived knowing how the song goes. They probably know before they arrive how to play the song. And with a couple of run-throughs, if we're well rehearsed, we should be able to pull the songs together really quickly. But what they don't know is how you are going to transition. And that is such a crucial part of how we flow from one song to the next. I think it's the most important part. A good thing about worship music is it's generally not very complicated. So I could, I could shut my eyes and tell you that on the next Bethel album, most of the songs will go verse one, verse two, run together. There'll be an introduction before that. They'll come into the first chorus, it'll be a single chorus. Then there'll be a single second verse. There'll be a double chorus followed by a triple bridge followed by a double chorus. That is like, honestly, how people, it, it's so predictable and it's how worship songs generally are written so we can have a good idea of the way that most songs, now by that I don't mean choruses, choruses are really simple, they just tend to be like one or two chord sequences run together, but with most songs there tends to be a flow to the song that we really understand, we know how it works, but that transition that comes next is so very important. And the reason that transitions normally go wrong is because you haven't spoken about what's going to happen in that moment. So this is the simplest way to transition. The easiest way to transition from one song to another is with one instrument. Just have one person. 
a piano player? Who's the lead in instrument? Is it the pianist or is it the guitarist that's going to be leading the next song? Just come down to the simplest form of music that you can. So when you come into transition and you're leading and maybe you're not playing an instrument, it don't feel in any way um, offensive to your band just to say, we're going to come down to the piano alone. Because the worst thing that can happen in that transition phase is when the guitarist and the piano are playing different chords. And it, it, listen, it happens often. It happens often. And it actually rocks even the congregation. The congregations might not be musical like you, but they get a sense of whether we're okay or not, and, or whether there is a sense of impending doom that the Titanic's about to sink in the church. You do, you get, that's what, music is like that. Music can rock us of our confidence. And the more simple you can make it, the more quickly and easily we can transition from one song to the next song. So think about that. Is it a guitar and the piano that are playing together? If it is, what is the chord sequence? Are they, play, are they changing key? Are they using different chords? Do they know how to get into the next key? With key changes particularly, I would always say, just let the pianist do it. And the piano player is gonna take you from one song into the next. But if you're a singer, I think where transitions can be really painful is when we just stand like this. And there's no singing, there's, there's nothing to provoke the congregation in any way. It's just like dead airspace. And most of our singers are actually really good at just improvising or spontaneously singing really simple things. You don't need to sing like a chapter of Romans. You can sing a re you can sing Jesus, I love you. You can sing you're worthy. You can sing we give you praise, but to have something that stirs us is better than dead airspace. And that's why I think it's really good in your, um, in your practice times to have times where you practice spontaneous singing. That's why we've got a workshop going on upstairs of spontaneous singing. I haven't heard very much from them yet. But we need to learn to cover the transitional phases so that it doesn't feel like our music is dying. But make sure everyone in the band knows exactly how this is going to work. Speak to the musicians. Who is it easiest for? Is the pianist going to do this? Is the, is the guitarist going to do it? Ensure that everyone knows which musician is going to lead because guitarists have a ter there is a selective hearing problem with most guitarists because they whittle. I don't mean, you know, whittle. I mean, they twiddle on their guitars. So when, do you have any of those in your worship teams when you speak to them and the guitar is just ding, 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 ding. You're trying to speak to them. It even breaks marriages, doesn't it, Dave, when your wife's trying to speak to you? And you, I don't know what it is about guitarists, but it feels like I'm receiving from my wife better when I play a tune. And then she'll say, did you hear me? Pardon, darling? And they're like, oh, listen to my latest riff. Ooh, but your marriage is failing because you're playing the guitar when you're married. Don't want to be doing that. <laughs> so we got, we got to stop everyone. Like, feel free. When you're talking about these, these are important things. Tell the band, be quiet. Everyone, shush. So you understand, and particularly with guitarists, you say, do you understand how we're transitioning? I'm sorry, what? Exactly. Which instrument is playing? And they will go, I'm playing. I'm always playing. <laughs> no, it's not you, darling. It's the keyboard this time. Just make sure that we understand where this whole thing is going. Now, look, there are certain things I think that we underuse as worship teams in transition phases. I think transitions can be so helpful. We can pray in a transition. Somebody can be changing key. We can pray over that. We can actually stir the spiritual atmosphere by praying. This is the thing I think is most underused in living hope worship. You ready for this? The Word of God. I don't think we read much scripture during our worship. I think we should. I think we should look at the songs that we're doing and think, well, what are the, have a look at the background to a song. What scripture has been used to facilitate the song and actually read the Word of God in that transitional phase. So we read scripture, but then the spontaneous singing element as well. You, your, your voice is an instrument. You can use it as an instrument. You can ooh, you can ah, you can sing melodies. But don't just let that space go dead. Use it for something that helps us. 
sometimes a key thing in transitional phases is set context for the song. I, I think we are so bad at singing things that just mean absolutely nothing to new Christians. Uh, and I've been thinking about, like I, one of the songs I love at the moment is Egypt. But even the fact it's called Egypt shows that we have a Christianese problem because Egypt means nothing to a non-Christian. They're just like, I wonder what the spiritual significance is of Egypt. Is it, is it something to do with Mo Salah from Liverpool football team? Is that why it's called Egypt? We need to start explaining. Listen to the words, right? They're brilliant words when you understand them. You stepped into my Egypt. Just be a non-Christian for a minute. You stepped into my Egypt. You took me by the hand. You marched me out in freedom into the promised land. Now, those are actually really good words, but the problem is, what's Egypt? What is it? And as worship leaders, you have the responsibility to help us understand what you're talking about. We've got to learn how to bring these things. Why, why is it a privilege for us to shout the name of Yahweh. What, what on earth does that mean to non-Christians? Why? I don't even know if I like that, to be honest. I think the Jews were reverent with it. But I think we should think about how we make songs understandable. So with Egypt, we could say in the Bible, Egypt represents slavery for God's people. But God has set us free. He's rescued his people from the slave master Pharaoh. And he set us free by the death and the resurrection of his son, Jesus. And now we are free from sin. And then you sing the song and suddenly Egypt means something. It, it, it's not a mystery anymore. So think about how to demystify and transitions can be so helpful in all of these areas. So practice your transitions thoroughly. Make sure everyone knows who's leading. Ensure everyone knows where the transition is going next. Make sure the musician knows what chords they are playing and make sure the musicians know what the worship leader is doing in that space. Now, one final tip for singers who are transitioning these songs. If there are particular chord sequences that you like singing over, and you'll know, like there, I know when I hear a song immediately, I'll think, oh, I'd like to sing over those chords. Like I feel like it's, my voice is free in that range. I, I, like, I can think of melodies that go over those chords. If you like those chords, Use those chords as your transition sequence because then it's easy. And you don't need to know what the chords are. You just go, you know the bridge chords from the song we just did? I like those to transition the next song because I can sing easily over that. So just think about how to make these things as easy as possible. Next thing I want to, is this helpful? Yeah. Hopefully it is. The next thing I want to talk about is dynamics, okay? So every song has a floor and a ceiling. This is musical talk now. The floor of a song is the quietest section of the song. It's the whisper section where it's going to be probably sparse in music. It's going to be maybe reflective in the words. And, uh, and we have these moments where we just think, right, we've got to emphasize with reverence certain things that we're saying in the song. But every song, and this is the drummer's favorite, is the ceiling, bro. <laughs> And Nelson loves the ceiling of the song because that is where we are just rocking out for Jesus. We are like full on going for it. And the person that sets the floor and the ceiling in every band is the drummer. Because he is the one that has all of the potential to play the loudest and to really set the tone of the song. And so I want you to think about this. There are moments in songs where as musicians, you should be so sensitive to the words of the song. And I think that musicians very often can get lost in the feel of a song, but not in the lyrical content of the song. And it's really important that the two things marry. And songs are gen generally written very carefully. When I write songs, I'm very careful about the way I'm going to use instruments to support the lyrical content. But as bands, I think once we get into the groove, it's like, oh, yes, we are just going to live in the 100% zone now. We're just rocking out. And the poor old singer has got this low, gentle melody, and the drummer is playing like Animal from the Muppets, and oh, the guitarists are grunging out, full lead guitar solos going on, and the poor worship leader is just going, man, you guys should just be the piano only. And the, the drummer's there going, what's a piano? Never heard of it. 
I don't play music, I hit stuff. And so I want to think about, I want to think about, let, let's just take a song. So we'll take What a Beautiful Name, okay? I, th- I like the words for most of this song. Verse 1. Just think about this. Try and think, like, musically about these words. I have this thing, by the way, called synesthesia. Has anyone ever heard of that? So I'm, I am a, I'm very rare. Like, synesthesia, people see colors when you play a chord or a note. So I see color. It really helps me with, like, mixing music and stuff. But I see things when I read this. You were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you are Christ. Now, I'm listening to those words, and I'm thinking there's a progression in these words. There's a progression of revelation. There's a mystery to God that is gently being revealed and fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ. And that's what these words are actually saying. Now, if you think about that musically, how, how do you think we should support that? Do we play at one dynamic level, or do we track the words with a progression of sound? Can you see what I mean? So I want to start just really quite low. You were the word at the beginning. I'm going to, everything's low. It could just be one or two instruments. The drummer could just be filling in with the cymbals. But then there's this progressive revelation where I want the music to swell. And you guys as musicians should be thinking like this all the time. You don't just come and strum your guitars Read the words of the song and think about how you can tune into those words musically to make them come to life. Whenever you will notice, you see when we sing about Jesus overcoming the grave, always, what happens in our congregations? Always. It's always the same. They start shouting. People, they don't even sing the song anymore. Most, it's just, Jesus! The song's gone, but the revelation has come. And as musicians, we've got to be supporting what's happening as we're reading and listening to these words. And I can hear things happening around these words. So I don't want too much music. So David, I want you just to come and demonstrate a little bit for us. And we're going to try and demystify the drum kit for you a little bit. Because the drum kit is made up of certain components. And most people that don't play the drums have no idea what you just like it. Just go, it's awesome. But what's it actually doing? And so when I read those words, I, like, this is what happens to me. I, see, I hear the word majesty. And when I hear certain chords and certain sounds, I see the white gold. It's like a specific color. And the only thing in music that produces white gold is these things, the symbols. There's something majestic about them. And I don't think this is accidental because they are mentioned in the Bible. Like the Bible talks about how we play on the symbols. So there's something holy about these instruments. So David, if we were playing like something just slow and just coming into the beginning of a song, how would you build that? Just show us the kind of things you could do. So you hear the build and we get the kick drum coming in. Nice. You feel the build with the kick drum. There's momentum coming. And then we're crescendoing into our chorus. We're crescendoing. Nice. Come on. Are you feeling it? Come on. I'm getting all worshipy up here. That's awesome. So listen, I'm going to jump in the booth with David. Just tell us what is going on. Help worship leaders. How did you start that and how did you build it? With cymbals, cymbals are nice and high. They're in a high range. They are not overpowering. Everything that is low hits hard and it really gets people pumping. But the high bits, the cymbals, the washes, it kind of like creates anticipation. And that's what you want when you're building is anticipation because that's leading to something. And then when you come in with a kick, when you come in with the lows, the, the, the toms, everything else, then that is when we've kind of arrived where we want to be, for now at least. So, That's brilliant. So helpful. 
I think the thing that makes a drum so unique is it's, it's got a whole different range of frequencies it can use. It can use low frequencies that add power, mid frequencies that add bulk, and it's got the top frequencies on the cymbals. There's no other instrument quite like that. And the drums really can, he can use the cymbals to be very, very beautiful, sparse, sparkly, quiet, majestic. But the cymbals on their own can still really swell and bring a sense of anticipation into a song. So think about how you would use a drum kit. The most simple thing is just a beat on the kick drum. This, that's it. You could almost write a song on the kick drum alone. In fact, if you listen to a lot of contemporary music, you will discover that a lot of songs are literally a kick drum, a kick drum and a hi-hat. There's just literally a low beat and a hi-hat that adds a sense of speed, tempo, and rhythm to the song. So learn about how you can use those. Don't go away quite yet, David. But we need to learn how to, to do that. Now, there's another thing that drummers can do, and I would call this, when we worked in bands or, or were recording music, we always talked about living in the 25, the 50, the 75%, and the 90% region. Okay, so the 25% region is when a drummer is pre playing pretty quietly. So, David, give us some, just some gentle kind of support. So this is, a, it's not obtrusive. It's quite a gentle beat. But as he's building up, he might move into the 50% zone. So it's getting a bit more solid. The whole thing's tightening up. And then we're going to go up to our chorus at 75%. So we're in a stronger pattern now. But then we're going to go to the 90% zone in the bridge. Here we go. Come on. Come on. Can you feel it? Oh, yeah. Oh, exciting. Perfect. And that drums can do so much. We, we can live in all of these different zones. And even as a singer, if you can understand the 25, the 50, the 75, and the 90% zone, it will help you in the dynamics of each of your songs. You don't need to know exactly what's going on, but he will understand. Nelson will understand. Sam Nelson will understand. You have to have Nelson to be a drummer in the church. They will, they will get this stuff. But think about, if you look at a, a song, to me, a song is a journey. It's a story and a journey. And I'm always thinking about how do I use the dynamics of songs. So, Typically, the way a song is written is your introduction will be quite sparse. It's going to be like a, a platform to build from. You might have a little riff that you're going to play. I don't know if you noticed today when Holly was leading worship, she led with the He Reigns song. But did you notice the riff for the bridge of Beautiful Name came in and she starts playing the piano? That's clever. Because nothing's happened. We are still singing the previous song, but she has planted something in our heads now that we know where we're going. And I'm just kind of going, oh, yeah. Oh, death could not hold him. It's coming. And I'm ready. And there's like that musical cue that helps us to understand the song is going somewhere. And that, that's, it's good to play music like that, to take us on a journey. But when you come in at the beginning of the song, the one thing a lot of worship musicians do is they think, well, I'm here, and therefore I shall play. And that's not what you do. The, the best friend you have is the mix of, of instruments. And even if you're three instruments, even if you're, I don't know where I put two fingers up, three instruments, even if you have a djembe, and you have an acoustic guitar, and you have a piano, you have three different options. Well, you've got multiple, they can all play together. The guitarist can play on his own, the pianist can play on his own, and the djembe player can play on their own. And one, I would say one of my favorite things in our own, like when I think about Shauna in the West, for instance, when we are leading, this is, what, this is what I love. This is such a great way to play music. We come to voices only. And you can, I often feel you feel like the Spirit's moving when it's congregational singing. There's something that just, you feel like the Holy Spirit wants to do something. And if you have a sensitive percussionist like um, Shauna, she might sometimes go, I'm going to play now. I'm going for it. And she'll start playing. And I don't know what it is, but that drum and the vocals is like top notch. And I'm a guitarist, 
But that is like my favorite moment. Drummers can do it. I love when we're singing a cappella and then the drummer start, the kick drum comes in. And there's something that we're using music. Now, these are, I, I know it's easy to think, no, no, we, we shouldn't do any of this. It's emotional. No, you embrace it because God has given us creativity. He's given us music to worship him. And the reason that we are responding to music is because he responds to it. He rejoices and he sings over us. He loves our musical worship. And so we just think about how we can build. And the way David just played there is a great example. So the 25% zone, that, that introduction, it can be as simple as just a hi-hat beat. This can change, like literally, that changes the way music feels. So you could come into the first verse and suddenly there's a count. And the count just orientates us in the tempo of music. But then in the, in the pre-chorus, the bit building up to the chorus, he might go into a simple beat. It might be just simple thing, beat. you see, just starting to build. And then that first chorus comes in. And I'm thinking now 50%, there's a bit of a pattern, but it's not the full thing. We're building, we're building. And then when we come into the second verse, we're starting to get into a steady rhythm of the song. So we're maybe 50%, but steady. When we come to that next chorus, we know we're crescendoing towards the bridge. So the drummer is starting to hit that 75% zone. And the reason I say that is because you don't want to blow all your candles out at the beginning. And this is one thing I always find as a worship leader. Very often what you'll find with worship songs is that a worship song will have a split bridge where the bridge starts off on a low melody and then it jumps to a third above or maybe even an octave above where the melody suddenly jumps and you, it, it's good songwriting because you feel the intensity of the build. But the thing I hated is when you've been at 100% in the bridge and you know the chorus is coming and the chorus is actually where the key message of the song is, but you just feel it and you go, we've got nothing more to give, Lord. We're going to back off and you come into that chorus and it just zoom. I hate that. Because that should be that pinnacle moment. And if we play in the 100% zone in the bridge, then the next chorus feels like it's all... If you've been in music where you feel like you just fought and you're like, oh, oh, that was oh, disappointing. Because we topped out too early. And that's why I would say for drummers, don't play 100% all the time. Play 90. So there's 10% less, 10% more when we need that final lift in our final chorus. And again, just think about what the lyrics of these songs are saying. I mean, it's so beautiful. Death could not hold you. What a beautiful lyric. Or you have no rival. You have no equal. You know, yesterday when we were talking about the Hebrew words for worship, we talked about the Shabbat. Do you remember that? That we're going to shout and declare the mighty acts of God to the next generation. And there must be those moments in our songs where we can Shabbat together. Those 100% moments where we are just absolutely going for it. And that's where knowing what your musicians can do is so very important. And it's good just to have a sense of what David's demonstrating us today of what, what's available to us. We can set that the drums can just do so much for us. But if we don't have drums, think about the combinations of your instruments. What does each one do? Is it something that we can start to use different combinations? Drummers don't have to play all the time. Percussionists don't have to play all the time. They can give us that extra 10% if we are smart in the way that we build up our songs. Now, the next thing, the final thing I really want to talk to you about is arranging, musical arrangement, because this is actually very important. And this is really what we're talking about, the combination of instruments. But maybe to think a little bit beyond that, because I, I would say that what I notice mainly in worship is everyone plays in the middle octave. So guitarists will play in the first to third to fifth fret. The pianist plays on the middle octave of the piano. And you're all fighting for every musical instrument produces a frequency of sound, like a wavelength. So if you play a middle C on a piano, it's 256 hertz. Ooh. If you play the A above C, it's 440 hertz. 
And that means that there's a wave of music in our building. Now, one of the things I said to the guys here is if you play a low E on a bass guitar, it produces a 15 meter long wavelength. And the worst possible thing that you could have is a building that is a 15 meter cube. Do you know what you're sitting in? A perfect 15 meter cube. And the problem with that is it creates something called a standing wave. So a base wave is produced and it can't actually move out of the building and it sits in the building. It literally just sits and resonates because of the length of the building and it just sits. And every time the bass player plays an E, another standing wave sits on it and you get this big rumble of noise that is building up. And so we got to start to think about, well, how do we spread the frequency of noise out? Because the problem is if the guitars and the piano all play in the middle octave, we lose the clarity of what the pianist is playing and we lose all of the sense of what the guitarist is playing. Now, just because you have an acoustic guitar and an electric guitar, if you play an F chord in the first fret, they might sound like different instruments, but they are producing the same frequencies. And that's why somebody invented something called a capo. Good. So when we have two guitars, when we have two guitars playing together, the guitars shouldn't be playing the same chords because it's easy. You need to start getting a bit more creative. And you need to start thinking about where am I going to put my capo so that we're playing in different parts of the guitar. You can play the same chords, but you're producing different frequencies. And suddenly, because you've arranged your music, you're starting to get a clarity. And I feel sorry for the poor sound guys who are going, I just can't, I can't hear the piano. It's like a big mush of sound. And I'll, I'll be looking at them going, yeah, because they are playing a big mush of sound. Because there's no arranging. And it's good to talk to each other if you've got multiple instruments, like for the one band, for instance. Electric guitars have got such a huge frequency range that they could use. And that's why, so if you listen to so much modern worship music, it tends to be shimmering chords played far up the neck, like high chords that cut through. They don't dominate the music. And then when we're getting big and beefy, think about what David was just doing on the drums. He's got his kick drum going. So when a guitarist wants to support this thing, is he going to go high or low? He's going to join it and he goes down to the bottom so that they're getting that powerful sound. And then you've got the bass player. And if you don't know what a bass guitar does, a bass guitar is a drum kit on a guitar. That's what it is. So the idea is that the bass player locks into two instruments on, he locks into this, and he locks into the snare drum. And the bass player is always playing off the bass drum, so he becomes the musical voice for the drum kit. And if the two are not synchronized and locked into each other, we lose the power of the song. And so bass players are always tracking, what, what's your kick pattern? What is it you're playing there? Or if you play bass like me, it's just an opportunity for a big guitar solo from start to finish. <laughs> So, but that's what the bass player is doing. He's going to lock into the drummer. And so they are like your rhythm section. They define the, the kind of uh, feel that our music's going to have. Then you've got an acoustic guitarist. What is an acoustic guitar? Well, it's a wooden guitar. It can be played in two ways. One thing that is desperately lacking in Christian music is finger pickers, because we're lazy. Got strummers, come on guys, you got four fingers on your right hand that can play this thing and it sounds better. So we can vary the guitar and we can play beautiful melodies like a piano on the guitar, but when we strum it, that is locking into this. So the acoustic guitar becomes the voice of the hi-hat. That's its voice. Every instrument becomes a voice of this thing. So the acoustic guitar should lock into the hi-hat. And when they play together, you start getting a synchronicity in the rhythm that brings a tightness to the sound and a much more effective sound. And the next thing I want to share with you is called the rule of three. Who's ever heard of the rule of three? It's very famous in music producing. So the rule of three is this. Your brain does funny things when you play music. When you play a riff, the first time your brain hears a riff, it goes, oh, 
That's interesting. The second time it hears a riff, you know what I mean by a riff, like a little melody, a repeating melody. The second time your brain hears a riff, it goes, oh, I can sing along because I know that. But the rule of three is this, and this is very, like if you write songs or you produce music, this is a key thing that you generally try to avoid. The rule of three is this, that on the third time round, do you know what your brain does? Just goes, not interested. And it tunes out, and you can't control it. It's just physiologically built into us. And the thing that kills me with Christian music is generally we have riffs that are playing over and over, and by the time we get to the singing, you're just going, oh, I just want to die. I don't want to worship anymore because I've heard that riff so many times. And it's why when you write songs, you generally have double choruses, not triple choruses. Have you ever noticed that? Because the rule of three is that you tune out on the third one. Is that helpful? I know it's a... And, and it's a good way to think when you're thinking about how you're pulling your songs together because I think what we, we sometimes love to do with our worship songs is we are going to flog the living daylights out of the bridge. And it's why we need so many worship songs coming through the church because we flog them so hard that they die quickly because we're not using the rule of three. And if we can just start to simplify things a little bit and not run threes together all the time, then we'll give longevity to our songs. But think about that when you're doing riffs. Think about doing a riff twice and then repeating it a verse later twice, but not three times because your brain is tuning you out and getting bored without even realizing it. It's every person, not just musicians. It's just a physiological fact. Interesting, eh? So we have to be thinking about these Think about these things. And then think about how you're going to build up your song with those riffs. Have you got a lead instrument? Is the guitar going to be the instrument that plays the main riff? Is the piano going to support it? Are they going to play something together which can work well? They can play in harmony as well. Keep your riffs quite nice and short and catchy. And remember, everything that we're doing as musicians is about the voice. It's all about the vocal and the lyrical content. That's what we're supporting. We're trying to make our songs come to life so that the lyrics and the thing that helps us to see God is the thing that comes alive. And everything else is support for that. It's all about him, all about seeing him through the word. That's why we worship in spirit and truth. Our minds are informed. It's, it's no good having people coming into our churches and singing all about how we're going to, going to respond to God if we haven't told them who he is. And so we're supporting the voices so that we know who we're worshiping, what God does, what is his character, what are his attributes and we're thinking always about how we can build these things up to be as effective as is humanly possible. Now the final thing to say is your vision teams. Nothing kills worship more badly than vision teams putting the wrong words up on the board and I think it's often our fault not their fault but it happens so often and I know I don't know what it is I might just be a stupid man but what happens with me, I'm very, subs- like I'm very submissive. So I am singing a song, and then the vision person puts the wrong words up, and I'm so obedient, I'll start singing those words. And I'm thinking, I'm sure these words aren't fitting right. In fact, I don't think I'm even singing the right song anymore. But I'm going to do what the vision operators told me, and the poor people very often don't know exactly what we're go- doing. So when we put things up on Planning Center, and you say, we're going to do... Great are you, Lord. And what you actually mean is you're doing the bridge of great are you, Lord. Don't, don't let them think they're doing the whole song, because when they hear you introduce it, they are ready to go to the first screen. You give life. And you're going, no, I don't want you give life. I want all the earth will sing. And I think these little things that go wrong in our services very often knock our congregations and could be really frustrating to people coming in new. So it's very important when you're bringing your set together, and you obviously you're going to have spontaneous bits. Obviously, it could change with the Spirit leading us a different way. But at the start of the service, go to the vision guy. Talk them through what you think you're going to be doing. Tell them which parts of the songs you're going to be using and what you don't need, because it makes their lives so much easier. And it really does help us to worship if we have as few distractions as we possibly can. So think about how to engage your vision teams. And then 
maybe as well as that, and we picked up on it in the Q&A, is our sound guys. Sound guys are part of your team. They're not a separate team. Sound is part of the worship. And I think sometimes we can make it quite difficult to work with us because we're bad communicators. And it's really often what I see is, I, and you'll probably see it, so if you want to see it, go to the villa tomorrow morning. There will be some singers who are so shy that when the sound guy says, what do you need? They just kind of go, <laughs> voice. <laughs> That's not helpful. Because there's lots of stuff that you're listening to in your monitor, and they want you to have the best sound that you can have. And don't be embarrassed. I used to always laugh at Owen Graham when he was on worship, and he'd be in the drum booth, and he'd have the headphones on, and it became a running joke in the band that whenever the sound, if Stephen Dallimore was playing on the cello, as soon as the sound guy said to him, what do you want, Owen? He'd just, say, he'd just go, take the cello out. <laughs> just get rid Get it out. And Stephen's just like, he always says that every time I'm playing. He just tells, just get, yeah, don't need that. Get it out. And get the cello out. And we, but actually, it's a good thing to do. You've got to get what you need in your mix because then you'll play more effectively. And don't be scared. If you want more drums, get more drums. If you need less drums, get less drums. Don't be offended if you want more of yourself on your monitor. Mix the music so there are as few distractions for you as is possible. But just communicate and don't do it in a frustrated way because sound guys can't hear what you're hearing because they're on the other side of your monitors. So they hear the big speakers. And when you're going, I want less of me, and they don't know it's not going down. So just say just a little bit less. Don't, and be helpful to one another because nothing is more frustrating than having a team that's at odds with itself. So try and just keep everyone on page and yeah, use some of those principles and you'll find that will help you as you lead your bands. Hopefully that helps a wee bit. It's a starter. Rule of three, remember that rule of three. Don't do things too many times. And I'm sure that we will go from strength to strength. Yes, David. Just very quickly. Um, just the first thing that I was thinking about. I think one thing that we really want to release, especially worship leaders that are not playing, is you are not offensive at all. If you guys want something specific, especially from a drummer, communicate it. Just say in this part of the drums, even if you hum it or kind of like, you know, beatbox it or something, because I've had that a lot, and it helps us, because we want to do, ex our job there is to serve you as the worship leader and to worship the Lord. It's to serve you, worship the Lord, and make you sound as, as good as you, you can sound. And the second thing, on, just on dynamics, I think especially even with guitar is plucking is very important and just like as even very simple like just dynamics with guitar don't just come in strumming that's something I had to learn so on the first verse I'm already strumming and everyone else is playing very quietly but I'm strumming in different volumes I'm strumming quietly or just learn how to pluck I think dynamics is also yeah very very important so that's excellent very good yes david just with adding dynamics on the uh, drums, how would that look on a cajon? Just because I, I know a lot of my worship team. So, well, so Sean, I'm gonna, I'll speak, and then if you think he's making an absolute mess of this, you say, okay. So I think adding dynamics on a cajon, you've got two frequency ranges. You've got effectively a bass and a snare drum. So you've got the bass with your lower hand, I think that's right, isn't it? And then you've got the, is there three? What's the third? The three is almost like a hat. It's if you tap it on the side. Okay. So it's like, it's like a mini drum kit, effectively. So you've got effectively like a hi-hat, you've got a snare on the top, and you've got a bass drum. So you can do like the sort of stuff that David was showing you, just single bass beats, doom, 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 doom. And then adding the slap of the snare in, and then adding the percussive stuff to it as well. But one of the con's greatest strengths is it doesn't have to play all the time. And that can be a dynamic of the song, that there's no percussion. And then when it does come in, it makes a huge effect because it's so contrasting to what we had before. 